Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us in the surfboard room for the event that um, this room was probably meant for. Um, we're so glad to partner with the Natural Sciences Division today to bring uh, Michael Blum here to speak with all of you. So without further ado, I'm going to bring um, Karen Martin, a distinguished professor of biology, and Frank R. Sieber, chair in the Natural Sciences, to introduce our speaker for today. Thank you so much. Thank you, it's my pleasure to uh, speak with you. I'm not as tall as Michael. <laughs> um, it's my pleasure to welcome everybody here today. I'm really delighted to have Michael here as a speaker. I've heard him speak before and I've spoken with him on many occasions about this topic, which is his passion. Uh, Michael grew up in this area. He went to uh, his undergraduate work in marine biology at UCLA and then went on to Duke University at the environmental, the uh, Nicholas School for the Environment and was also working on a master's degree in zoology on penguin swimming flight. Um, his, his master's thesis that he's gonna talk about today, um, has, he has gone beyond this, but this is what he started, was protecting surf breaks and surfing areas in California. He's taken a really unique and uh, very successful approach to this, something that nobody else has ever thought of doing before. We're really amazed and pleased to have him here to explain his thinking and what he sees for the future and why this particular place that we love here in Malibu is so special for these purposes. Michael. Good morning, everyone. I know on a busy day, on a beautiful day, um, it takes some amount of energy to come and sit with, to come and sit and uh, listen to someone's talk. So I'm greatly appreciative for your attendance, and I hope it's worth your time. I also want to um, express my, my appreciation for being able to talk in such a beautiful room as this, in a conversation about surfing, coastal history, our recent work in Malibu, and if you'll permit, some early thoughts on marine cultural heritage. I want to take a, a moment to thank both the Pepperdine Libraries and the Natural Sciences Division for their interest in these ideas. Early in the research of our Malibu project, I had the good fortune of spending an afternoon in this very room, photographing and taking measurements of these special surfboards, including the two surfboards on either side of that door, um, one that isn't here at the moment, and especially that yellow board down at the end. These surfboards, as you see themselves, narrate a story of California surfing. And for that, I want to thank Melissa from the library, as well as Mr. John Maza, for arranging that access and his patronage of, of donating this special collection to Pepperdine. I also want to thank Alice for helping someone like me who doesn't visit this school very often um, to arrange my arrival. And finally, I'd like to thank Karen Martin, whose work at Malibu and affection for this coast has been a continued source of inspiration. As a participant, admirer, or spectator, we come to surfing through any number of doorways. It can be a sport friends or family introduce to you, introduced while on travel, introduced in its artifacts curated in a museum, its surfers described in print, or its goods sold in a store. Or it can be introduced through cultural expression, art, music, film, or like here, watching Wilma Flintstone learn to surf. Today I'll talk about surfing areas like Malibu as the physical representations of these entryways. I'll describe the ideas and stories which animated our work, the project at Malibu to formally recognize a property based on its surfing history, and finally some suggestions about where this work may lead next. Seeing the coast as surfers, often with one eye on the road and another scanning a combination of wind, tide, swell, and crowd, we are connected to places. We mark the coast as a catalog of surfing breaks and surfing areas we find important. Places we surf at or would like to surf at. Places, in short, we have a stake in. And so this talk is also about working within a coastline changing across multiple dimensions to build processes and pathways in which such places are responsibly considered within coastal governance. Now a project like this has any number of stories of thanks, indebtedness, reference, and origin. One of mine starts here at Malibu, certainly, 
with its people, surfers, activists, its beaches and waves. This is Matt Kivlin surfing Malibu in 1951. But another origin story <clears throat> for this work begins a couple of hundred miles to the northeast in Yosemite Valley. It was here between the late 1940s and early 1970s that elite climbers planned and executed many of the first descents of Yosemite's famed granite walls. They discussed and debated, even fought over, the philosophies of climbing, and they developed the equipment and techniques to realize their ambitions. Yosemite climbers came to gather seasonally at Camp 4, an unimpressive site on the north side of the valley near Yosemite Falls. Their convening and connecting, hanging out and hanging together, has made Camp 4 within the climbing community an important place of community, tradition, and history. The achievements of Yosemite climbers during this golden age increased the sport's visibility to the general public, growing its popularity and affirming climbers' later requests for resources and policy preferences. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, whether spectators on the valley floor of the previous slide or climbers ascending the cable ladder route of Half Dome here, Yosemite has also become a climbing destination, <clears throat> a place to go to, a place just for that purpose. Yosemite, in this way, the park's overall context has expanded to be associated with to provide opportunities for this activity. And to note where innovation and achievement continues today. Taken earlier this summer, this photo shows the climber Alex Honnold, who together with his climbing partner scaled the 2,900 2, foot nose route of El Capitan in under two hours. By comparison, the first ascent of the nose in 1958 took over 45 days. <clears throat> Place as, a site, as sites of gathering. Place as sites of sport. Place as destination. Sites enriched by community, culture, and history. These are the lessons of Yosemite's golden age of climbing. Let us ask exactly if and how, possess, if and how surfing possesses sites similar to climbing. We start like climbing with a specific typology which embraces the social, intergenerational, and communal aspects of surfing. This is a foundation of the sport to be sure, but it does contrast a conventional established image of the surfer alone against an angry sea. <clears throat> our communal, social, our we of surfing, if you will, takes place in the water and on the beach at places you know. Places like the shack at Wind and Sea, the shack at San Onofre, the pit crew shack at Rincon, and at one time, the shack at Malibu. Surfing is indeed conducted at places like this, at surf breaks and surfing areas, where participants have interacted directly with their surrounding environment to create sites of community, of recreation, of tradition, of history and culture. These sites help define the contours of the sport and gives surfers and larger communities a defined cultural focusing point. Over the past three years, we had the special opportunity to examine these ideas at Malibu, at the iconic surfing area of Malibu Point. The Malibu Creek watershed is a 108 square mile area and the second largest watershed draining into Santa Monica Bay. Malibu Creek is the watershed's main artery and outflows into Malibu Lagoon at the Pacific Ocean at Malibu Point. Now surfing is site specific. Coastal and nearshore physical features define specific wave types. Coral reefs, submarine canyons, and nearshore sandbars are features associated with specific types of surf breaks and a range of surfable wave heights. Malibu in this typology is a point break, a surfing area influenced by river or creek outflows. Incoming wave energy focuses around a point of land formed by these outflows and refracts as it breaks toward a cove. Although defocused wave energy at point breaks reduces overall wave size, it produces long and well-formed waves. And it's these well-formed waves, along with its associated features, make Malibu one of the world's most recognizable 
and important surfing areas. Now, our conceit in this project was that surfing sites connect nature on one hand to culture on another, a perspective that has a direct focus on surfing's we character. We also believe that these connections at Malibu met, the, met standards for recognition, illumination, celebration, and importantly, protection. At Malibu, we employed a, signat a signature tool of historic preservation, the National Register of Historic Places, as our framework to examine cultural and historic significance. The National Register is the nation's official list of historic properties worthy of recognition. Established by federal statute over 50 years ago, the National Register comprises some 90,000 properties and 1.4 million objects. In Los Angeles, gathering places such as the Rose Bowl, the Forum, Union Station, and the Shrine Auditorium are all listed in the National Register. Now, this is typical of the Register. In our daily lives, we interact with the National Register most frequently, frequently excuse me, with either products of our built environment or places in our historic past. In shorthand, we interact with the National Register with buildings and bridges on one hand, with battlefields and burial grounds and other sacred sites on the other. Now, if the National Register's 90,000 properties are dominated by such listings, they aren't limited to them. More to the point, the National Register is not some hall of fame of exalted architecture deserving of a plaque here or a sign there. It is a planning tool, a framework for communities to express an appreciation and importance of special places. And this, after all, the validation of place is an underlying premise of both historic preservation and environmental conservation. The Malibu surfing area, designated as the Malibu Historic District, is now listed in the National Register of Historic Places for its significance in the growth of surfing in America. This project marks the first National Register listing centered on surfing history and extends a previous honorific designation of Malibu as the, as the world's first world surfing reserve. This National Register listing also uniquely confirms three periods of California history in the same area of Eastern Malibu. The archeological site representing the period of Native American settlement, the Adamson House representing California's mission and rancho period, and now the Malibu Historic District representing the post-war period of coastal leisure and recreation. The 160 acre Malibu Historic District is entirely contained on public property and shared among three state and county owners. The area contains both landside and near shore areas and includes the famed first point, second point, and third point surf breaks, as well as the Malibu Pier as contributing resources. The district also includes public acreage contributing to a sense of the overall visual environment and setting. This listing preserves a management operation and property ownership regime across a number of dimensions. The important ways in which Malibu is currently accessed and enjoyed does not change. But the Malibu Historic District does secure a legal definition and a set of benefits and protections explicitly from the point of view of its historic significance. That is, for the first time, from the point of view of surfing. Beyond honorific and reputational benefits of a listing in the National Register, important as they are, the Malibu Historic District formalizes a legal boundary in coastal resource planning. Projects must disclose potential adverse effects on nearby historic resources, and if feasible, consider ways in which those effects may be mitigated. The Malibu Historic District was nominated by describing a 15-year period following World War II. It recognizes a group of pioneering shapers and designers who reimagined a surfboard's performance and material construction, making boards lighter, stronger, faster, shorter, more maneuverable, and quicker to produce. To realize this design program, shapers access new materials, 
fiberglass, polyester resin, and polyurethane foam, which were being transferred out of the war effort and here locally into LA's aerospace industry. Surfers were among the first civilians to procure these materials in limited quantities. They also accessed stores of balsa wood in South Bay Navy Yards. The Malibu Historic District is the beach of Bob Simmons, shown here at Malibu, and he's the one who shaped those two boards on either side of the, the doorway behind you. It's the beach of, it's the beach of Joe Quigg, Mac Kivlin, Del Velzi, and Dave Sweet. The district recognizes surfers who combine these new boards with the perfect waves of Malibu to develop a, re a relaxed, high-performance, cool style of surfing. This is the beach of Simmons, shown here at Malibu in 1947. It's the beach of surfers like Matt Kivlin, Les Williams, Ricky Grigg, and Buzzy Trent. It's also the beach of pioneering female surfers, of it's the beach of Vicki Flaxman, shown here surfing at Malibu in the early 1950s, of surfers Aggie Bain, Robin Grigg, Claire Cassidy, and Daryl and Zanuck. And it's the beach of Nick Gabaldon, LA's first documented surfer of African-American descent, shown here at Malibu in the late 1940s. Gabaldon would lose his life in 1951 in Big Surf at Malibu. And the district recognizes a youthful, bohemian, energy-filled look of surfing, a look closely identified with California and then sold to the rest of the world, a look described through the stories and adventures of a bright, spirited teenage girl who traded sandwiches for surfing lessons. This is the beach of Gidget, shown here in the mid-1950s. It's the beach of Tube Steak, Moondoggy, and the Pit. Malibu, and if you'd like Gidget in particular, was the KT boundary of surfing, the asteroid in the Yucatan that changed everything after it. What came was an important, but to some, an exploitation of surfing at Malibu. This duality can be seen in the following. Longboard surfboards, the stock and trade of Malibu surfing, are known internationally as MALs. And similarly, longboard surfing, longboard-based surfing clubs are Malibu clubs, such as Queensland's Noosa Malibu Club. Yet, less than, ten, or less than 10 years from the publication of Gidget and five years from the release of the eponymous film, Malibu had become somewhat of a lost Eden. From Bruce Brown and his documentary that followed two surfers around the world, every surfer dreams of finding a place as good as Malibu. By the mid-1960s, Malibu was a reference, but one of many destination sites. To accomplish this, surfers extended their surfing geography well beyond Malibu. In, well into the 1970s, they decamped from Southern California to places like Baja, Mexico, Australia's Sunshine Coast, and Hawaii's Outer Islands. Finally, early experiments in the design and production of surfboards through the design program mentioned before were refined into high volume operations with the triad of fiberglass, resin, and, and polyurethane foam becoming a surfboard's standard material construction for over 40 years. Our project believes the cultural analysis of natural sites, of cultural landscapes like Eastern Malibu, create true conservation opportunities through the practice, tools, policies, and aspirations of historic preservation. What then does this project suggest for future work? Let me outline three ideas. First, there should be more projects like the Malibu Historic District, which describe and recognize places associated with the growth of surfing in America. We envision regional networks of recognized and celebrated surfing areas, where sites are individually recognized for their significance, and whose emergent network connections help define its own historic context. We envision a network of recognized and linked surfing areas, like the network of Carnegie Libraries, like the California Mission System, like North Carolina's historic lighthouses, one of which is shown here. Second, we also believe there are other coastal sites possessing stories outside of the sport of surfing, which deserve our interest and attention. 
This is a photo of the Japanese fishing village founded in 1899 at the foot of Santa Monica's Temesco Canyon <clears throat> and just north of the Long Wharf, shown in the background. <clears throat> By 1920, the village was condemned, and most residents had moved south to a larger village at Terminal Island in Long Beach. Today, the beach here is a state beach, and the wharf, or what remained of it, was a Cal is a California landmark, but no designation or history has been told of the fishermen and their families which, who lived here. Now, we are working with community members at a site like this, not this one, but one like it, a non-surfing coastal site possessing significant history, and we plan to announce that project in mid-December. Finally, a listing in the National Register is a qualifying step for other designations and protections based on cultural significance. The ongoing project of coastal and marine conservation, of protecting places and resources we value, are constructed upon three pillars. So this is my three pillars slide. Natural heritage, protecting habitat and species. A pillar protecting the sustainable production of those resources. And third, a pillar of cultural heritage. All of the work in this area, all of it, has been toward the conservation of natural resources and their sustainable production. Has been for the support of pillars one and pillar two. Conservation of our marine cultural heritage, rich as it is, has not yet been developed. The arrows and dots on this map show where the state of California has designated a marine protected area in Southern California waters, an area to protect natural heritage resources through some level of exclusion, whether that restriction is put upon commercial fishing, recreational fishing, or access to the area altogether. These are then essentially wildlife refuges of a certain type. <clears throat> While we have determined this was important for a number of reasons, it is in and of itself insufficient to describe our coastal history and our, and our products of our interaction with the coast. The idea of protecting cultural heritage is not controversial in the program of land conservation. Here, I want to return to Yosemite. We certainly protect natural resources there. After all, it is a national park. We protect the valley, we protect the Tuolumne Meadows, we protect the Mariposa Sequoias, and we protect the Sierra Bighorn Sheep. But, we also protect the history and the products of human settlement in the valley. We protect archaeological sites. We protect more than 900 National Register listed resources in the valley alone, including the Awani, or formerly the Awani Hotel, which is now a national landmark. Camp 4, the gathering site for Yosemite's climbers that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, is also listed in the National Register for its contributions to the golden age of American rock climbing. To this end, we believe that the state of California has the statutory authority to designate marine managed areas, recognizing exceptional recreation and areas possessing cultural significance. The state has not yet exercised this authority. There have been no areas such, so designated no areas, despite California's rich commercial and military maritime history, its extensive seafaring history of Native American peoples, and as shown by the Malibu Historic District, <clears throat> its significant post-war coastal recreational history. We believe the project of coastal and marine conservation must be expanded. It must be broadened. It must be deepened to include sites possessing cultural and historical significance. I am here to enlist all of you in a project. People are connected to places. Our work realizes a promise of site-specific protections secured in part through perceiving surfing areas as natural sites available for cultural analysis. 
a project then which illuminates the value and contributions of landscape to our coastal history. I am here to enlist you in a project. I, there's some people at the, the back door, if someone could let them in. I am here <clears throat> to enlist you in a project. The practice of historic preservation can deliver positive conservation outcomes to sites which lack physicality but are rich in story. I'm here to enlist you in a project. The Malibu Historic District establishes a process and precedent for other projects at coastal places, places that you may be connected to. I'm here to enlist you in a project. Marine cultural heritage is as yet an unrealized pillar of the Coastal Conservation Project. I'm here to enlist you in a project. This work is born and reborn in communities, in collaboration, and in rooms like this. It's born and reborn in the relationships, conversations, struggles, and victories of a continued effort to recognize and celebrate our history. The decision to attend school here, or to work here, or like me to visit here, I must guess, is determined in part by an appreciation in Malibu or coastal areas more generally. And with that appreciation, support projects like ours or others as continued expressions and values of how you think about the coast. Become involved in community discussions about coastal places you feel connected to and vote to have governance systems reflect your coastal values, priorities, and interests. I want to thank you again for the privilege to be with you today. We're going to have a little bit of time for questions, which is great. Um, I also wanted to recognize John Maza is here, right here, who is the donor of all these wonderful surfboards. <clears throat> and this is a wonderful, this, I have always enjoyed coming into this room, and I, I have enjoyed even more now that I know more about it. It's really terrific. Thank you for that wonderful talk. I'm sure that has gotten a lot of people thinking and has some questions. So if anybody has questions, Alice has a microphone. They're recording this, so we want to ask the questions on mic, if you don't mind. Any questions? We have one back here. Uh, we'll so far, excuse me, just a second. We'll keep an eye on the time for. I know a lot of you have classes, so we'll keep an eye on the time. We're we're doing fine for time. So far, what's the greatest hurdle that you've experienced with creating these designated areas that of historical value? So um, you're giving me far too much credit. I have a sample size of exactly one. <laughs> um, so um, the hurdle is is uh, it's such a great question, and, and I don't. Uh, there are so many different ways that I can answer it. I think from my own work, um, it was becoming familiar with the practice and procedures of creating, of, of developing a nomination for the National Register. My background isn't in historic preservation, um, so I'm new to that game. And uh, when I first submitted the nomination, which was December of 2015, I was told to expect revisions. You know, nothing is perfect on the first round. It's not going to move to the next step automatically. Expect some revisions. The revisions came back in a list of, of 70 different itemized requests. Everything from, we want you to use feet, and I did everything in meters, um, to, hey, you just didn't really address what this section needed to be. And that's okay. You know, those are, hopefully, the second project is better than the first, right? And the second one is more efficient than the first. And I'm hoping that, or I'm not just hoping, I'm expecting that that's what it would be. Um, maybe at a more... Um, from a community level, I think the community, I think it's fair to say that there were some questions, but no real objections. I found just a warm well of support and interest in this idea. And um, these projects are, are essentially community-driven, and so they're not worth doing without that 
goodwill and without that interest from the community, not just for the project, but how it sustains. And um, I'm still looking for that, that hard, fast, like next big hurdle um, that is not just internal, right? How do, you, how, do you make a pro how do you make a project more efficient? How do you run an organization more efficiently? But I think maybe to the core of your question, where might that objection come? What would it look like from external sources? And how might you address that? Thanks, Alice. I'm always interested in how someone personally becomes uh, connected to a project. So I know you mentioned to me a little bit your Malibu connection, but maybe if you could talk a little bit about you know, your interest in Malibu and uh, sort of all that. Sure. How you came to this sure. process. Um, I had the good fortune for being able. To, uh, I had the good fortune for several years of being able to be a first point surfer at Malibu, and it's a it's a set of memories and experiences and and waves that I think will always will be permanently etched in my, you know, in my surfing record book. But in but part of being a Malibu surfer is also becoming aware of some of the other coastal issues that either that either impinge upon Malibu directly or are more representative of coastal issues that surfers are struggling with. And I think if there, might, there was um, one event that I think catalyzed some of these ideas, it was probably the Trestles toll road fight. Um, the proposed project to construct a connecting road from South County, San Diego, or South, South Orange County into the I-5 and which would, because of its alignment, would be proposed to go through you know, the surf break at Trestles, through an, a ceremonial site, um, to impinge upon any number of imperiled species, and for private gain. And I, it occurred to several of the activists that were rising up at that time, if that could happen, and it could get so close to approval, at a place that's so warmly loved as Trestles, what does that mean? What might that look like for the other crown jewels of Southern California surfing? And I think that more than anything started to, um, maybe if it didn't keep me up at night, it certainly kept me going through the day to ask what might this look like? Where might you come, how might you develop positive solutions, proactive solutions that don't wait for the bad project to be put on a planning commissioner's desk, but maybe work a few years out to provide some of this recognition and designation and hopefully some level of protection to these important coastal sites. Thank you for the question. I, th I think you're all lucky to go to Pepperdine and live here in Malibu because this, if you look out that window, you see First Point which is really why he picked this as the first project. Because culturally, this sport had more effect on the United States than any other sport. And you, and you don't realize that because you think, oh, that'd be football or something else. But the way you dress and your attitudes are different because of the mid-50s surfers. And Gidget opening up sports to women. Uh, and the fact that you can't be a real surfer full-time surfer, unless if you have a job, essentially. These were, the original people were akin to, to uh, Jack Kerouac on the road. They, they decided that there's a lifestyle different than working every day. They came out of the depression. You can't surf unless there's waves, and if the waves are up, you better go. You don't go to work. So a lot of surfers are waiters, etc., or they're in the surf industry which did not exist in the 50s. So what happened is you opened up a different way of thinking and you opened up a different way of uh, dressing. Ugg boots or surf stuff. Practically every t-shirts, the first printed t-shirts were either hot rod or surfboard uh, in the late 50s. Um, and so it's a huge influence on people in Kansas and people in Texas and wherever they wear surf stuff. And uh, if you go on my website, uh, not my website, my Facebook page, you'll see a guy named Tom Blake. 
his philosophy, and it's, it's very religious and very into the nature, uh, but, it's, but it tunes into the way the United States became after the 50s. It was real uptight in the 30s. You were either poor or, or in the you know, 20s it was loose, but it, it, yeah. it's, it's a different way of thinking and a different way of acting, different way of dressing. And you have people at Pepperdine that go way back. Uh, Patty Panicia is, uh, was one of the first uh, pro surfers, and she teaches uh, law here every once in a while. Um, and she's on the Board of Surfing Heritage. Uh, Glenn Brummage is here as head of that. Uh, so you'll see people like Gidget. Just to give you an example, in the, say, mid-50s, early 50s, there were probably 500 surfers in the world that actually surfed. And that's probably an exaggeration. And when Gidget came along and they made the movie, the very next year there were millions. And two years after that, there were probably five million. That's what changed all this stuff. And it, it really had a big impact on society. And that's one reason why this is a very important place. Because it really was where they met because it's the best surfing there is. Now, global, global warming is another thing you may be interested in. Uh, you saw the picture of the Japanese fishing village down at uh, Chautauqua. Uh, how wide was that beach? Probably as wide as this room. Well, now it's hundreds of feet wide, and it's got a highway through it. That may not be there you know, 20 years from now. Who knows? That's the way it was in 1905, right. or whatever it was, and 100 years later, it's different. Uh, so, take advantage of being in Southern California and being right here and all the history right here. I'm on the board of the Adamson House. You can go there and take tours. It's, it's really an amazing place. Uh, and the, that guy owned all of Malibu. And that's the spot he picked to live. Um, so, while you're here in California, soak up a little of the, uh, the culture and especially women. Uh, Surfing was open to women. You can see right here, there's a woman right there in 1958 or so, surfing. Um, it, it wasn't closed, and at that time, sports sort of were. Uh, and it's grown into a multi, multi, multi-billion dollar industry because of the culture, not because of the surfboards. Um, the surfboards tell a history of the development, but the, he picked out the right thing, the culture change the United States. If anybody wants to stick around, I can, I can tell you about the surfboards if you want later, or we'll just walk around. That was pretty cool. Thanks, John. Thank you. <coughs> uh, any other questions? I, I was just, you mentioned the Adamson House, and you told me a story about one of the people who used to, it used to be closed to the public to come down, down this area. Pacific Coast Highway didn't exist, right? And so there was really no way to get in here unless you worked here in Malibu on the ranch. Right? But there was a surfer that found out a way. So the, the family that owned all of this land, they owned the 13,000 acres of what was the last span, one of the last Spanish land grants in all of California. In an effort to protect their private property, underwent a, or undertook a series of lawsuits to prevent roads being um, established through their property, what is now Pacific Coast Highway. And in order to fund those efforts, they liquidated most of their incredible wealth, but they also created new businesses around that too. And one of them was the decorative tile works of the Malibu potteries. If you see some of the decorative tile um, that's imitated here on, I, I think, the, the square here at, at Pepperdine, but also down at City Hall and, and some of the stairs. Um, it was a pottery works that was just beyond Malibu Pier. And the story is, is that there was a famous surfer from the Santa Monica area who picked his girlfriend based on the fact that she worked at the Malibu Potteries. And so she would be, he would be allowed into the property every afternoon to come and pick, what, what he said was to come and pick her up and take her back to Santa Monica. But he was also able to get into the area and go surfing as well. So um, as John was saying, you need to be a little bit crafty to support your lifestyle. <laughs> Um, and I commend that to you, that um, 
if he found a way for it to work, uh, apparently the relationship was a good one, so she found a way for it to work as well. Um, that sounds like a, a wonderful way to spend your days. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. Yes. Thank you.